right, we're in week two of our series, Limitless. As I've told you, I'm kind of preaching to the choir because I tell my pastor friends away from here when they ask about CLC and what's so special, I tell them I really pastor what I would consider possibility-oriented people. And so I don't preach to this a whole lot. Thank you. Uh, I preach to a lot of openness and okay, what about? And evidenced by the fact that uh, we have a few more people in the room than normal because I warned you last weekend, uh, you're not going to want to miss the end, but the end cannot be online. So those of you that are with us, still stay with us through the message. I think you'll still enjoy it. And uh, we had a great week. Yesterday was the 10,000 Fathers Man in the Mirror seminar that we hosted here with people from several uh, states. And that's a great kickoff. Uh, earlier in the week on Wednesday, we had our annual church council meeting before our prayer service. It was just really powerful. And uh, at the council meeting, I announced too that uh, Tuesday morning, uh, my 91-year-old mom uh, went to be with the Lord. And uh, she had uh, been independent until about three years ago and then went to live with my sister, uh, had some health issues, and uh, had COVID and then pneumonia back in March and never got out of a, a facility from then. And so her prayer was, I don't know why the Lord doesn't take me home. Uh, I talked to her Monday night before she died, uh, barely uh, responsive. But I told her about heaven, and I prayed that the Lord would take her there soon and give her grace until he did. And so she's absent from the body and with the Lord, and so we're going to miss her. Uh, after I'm done with this, we're going to drive to Cleveland for a viewing, and then I'll be speaking in the service tomorrow. So if you keep us in prayer for that, I appreciate it. Uh, you missed an, an exciting church council meeting, uh, if budgets and board members can be exciting. Uh, and I want to share with you, since most of you weren't there, uh, one slide uh, from our annual report. And uh, that's a pie diagram. What I want to draw your attention to is that on a $9 million budget, you'll see our actual income was $12 million last year. Um, so you can give a hand for that. We have learned that we're blessed to be a blessing. We have learned the value of tithing, giving God our tithes and offerings, which, is, which tithe means a tenth beyond. Uh, and so we give God that uh, obediently. Uh, and so about a million dollars of that was just additional tithing going in. And uh, you already know that we, we invested in our God-sized vision. Uh, but then I remember the day, I'll never forget it, I don't think. Um, I was in the cafe one afternoon. And our cafe is open on Tuesday and Wednesday, by the way. There's free Wi-Fi. There's coffee. It's a great work environment. If you work remotely, people are starting to use that more and more. So feel free to come on up and just uh, make yourself at home in, in a cozy corner and enjoy it. Uh, I was doing that, and a couple came in. I knew they were coming by sometime. And uh, the wife said, this is the biggest check I've ever written. And when I opened it, I said, this is the biggest check I've ever seen. And they said, we'd like it to go to the God-sized vision if it could, uh, because as a donor, uh, you can't direct where it goes in a nonprofit, but you can make a request, a suggestion. And we said, surely we can do that. And so they, they added, they gave to us, part of that $12 million includes a check for $2 million. So praise God for that. Uh, come next weekend because Patrick will share with you the God Size Vision booklet that we gave out last Wednesday. And you'll see that at CLC, when you give as you just did uh, your tithes and offerings, we take 25% of the general fund and put it in the God Size Vision fund that literally goes around the world. Last year, we reinvested $2.4 million from what you gave into 34 projects in 13 countries. And uh, to give that a perspective, the bottom chart, there are actual expenses. I love this. Outreach, which is missionaries, relief organizations, and mission trips, uh, 12%. God-sized vision, 28%. We literally gave away or reinvested elsewhere 40% of our income. So give God a hand for that. And I am so thankful to pastor a church like that, a generous congregation. And understand that when we talk about the God-sized vision fund, um, we have strict criteria does it meet needs in our Jerusalem, our Judea, our Samaria, uttermost parts? I'll talk about that later. And then we have criteria that they've got to meet as an organization. Uh, and we read a book uh, several years ago called Toxic Charity by Robert Lupton. If you haven't read it, if you're into that sort of thinking, read it. It's a great book. It makes the, the case very undeniably that most of what churches and nonprofits do and government agencies is toxic when it comes to charitable activity trying to help people who are in need. If you're really going to help them in need, you don't want to keep them in that state of dependency, but help them become independent and self-sufficient. And so we've really reprocessed what we do as a church. And so when we, we have, we have a, an entire 
It's a God-sized vision investment team, a team of people who are financially uh, able and they are ministry-minded. And I tell them, you're kind of like a, a, a ministry mutual fund. Uh, your job is to research, and they do. They research ministries. They receive applications. They see if they ma match the criteria, uh, and then they'll give the grant. You can read that in the, bu the booklet next year, uh, next week. And, uh, and then we require uh, accountability uh, because we want to make sure that the way the money was designated gets spent. And then we ask them for feedback so we can celebrate that, so we can tell you. And that's why we show videos and whatnot at different times. Hey, this happened, that happened because of your giving. Uh, and so we just want to keep perpetuating that uh, with a sense of accountability because we believe it's God's money. And it's given through each of us uh, to CLC and to our God-sized vision. So it's just exciting what God is doing. Thanks for being part of that. And uh, so we're going to jump into the message this weekend. And if you enjoy the messages, we've been doing something that we're going to take to a new level. Uh, on Wednesday nights, we have discipleship and activities for kids, for youth. We have adult classes. Uh, but if you're not in one of those classes, you can say, what's going on at CLC on Wednesday night at 7 o'clock in the West Auditorium? We've had something called Deeper Dive that we're kind of enhancing that. Uh, we've got some team leaders that are going to help us with that. We'll take the message and go deeper with it every Wednesday at 7. This Wednesday, I'm going to be kicking that new season off. So I'll be doing Deeper Dive Wednesday night at 7 o'clock in the West Auditorium. Can you say the, the initials DVR? Got it. Use it. Whatever you were going to watch, come here instead and just watch without commercials at 9 o'clock when you get home, all right? Uh, it's good stuff. So be with us for a deeper dive. I'll look for you in the West Auditorium. And we're going to take the last two weekends and go deeper. And then we'll do that every, every week. So with that said, uh, let's jump into our math problem uh, that we talked about last week. Me plus God plus faith plus something else equals possibilities. Last week, we, we looked at me plus God plus faith, which Hebrews defines as the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Those three plus, last week it was little things, equal great possibilities. And we saw how God can take a simple prayer and a few hours of time and, and do something incredible with it. This week, we're going to introduce something else that you can very much relate to that I can't wait to talk about. So let's go. If you have the CLC app, you can follow along. The notes are in there. The, the, the sermon verses are in there as well. But let's talk about two things not to do with light. I know that's not the best sentence grammatically. But let's talk about two things not to do with light. And uh, for a, a proof text, let's look at Matthew 5, verse 14 and 15. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. Say we are. Yeah. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. So I want to illustrate what not to do with a light. And so I have a light, and we also have dark. See how that works? So we're in the dark now, and if we turned everything off, it'd really be dark, but it's dark enough for my sake, and I have a light. Hey, Steve. Okay, I, I mean, and, and wow, and so now you're like hoping I don't, I don't stop on you. Uh, all right, because you just never, all right, and I mean, light is helpful. You want to get out. I can show you the way out. Okay, I can show me the way out. Okay, light is really great in the dark. It's necessary in the dark. When you're driving down the road, you want lights on, on your vehicle in the dark. I mean, it's real important. And Jesus said the one thing that you don't do with light, all right, let's go back uh, the verses of Batuchim. You don't hide it, okay? Let's go back to the verse I think I skipped. Right? I didn't read this. You're the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. It gives light to all who are in the house. Okay, kill those slides because there's too much light. There. See, too many of us do this. We are the light of the world, now, the world definitely needs the light, but we hide it. We're a Christian, sort of, but we just don't let people know. Now, the other thing that you don't want to do with a light, let's, let's get lights back, is that you don't want to live, don't live in a darkless relational universe. Because right now, the light doesn't do much of anything. 
I can help you find your way out. It doesn't, you don't need it to see your way out because it's already light in here. And far too many of us sociologists who study Christians tell us that after a person's been a Christian for two or three years, they have almost no friends who are living in spiritual darkness. They don't go to dinner with lost people. They don't hang out with lost people. They don't, nothing with lost people because all of their people are Christians. And they live in a darkless relational universe. That's not what Jesus did. Jesus, in fact, the Bible, you, you'll go to the Gospels, 18 times in the Gospels, it talks about sinners somehow relating to Jesus. Whether they came to hear him, Je be, they, Jesus was, they were drawn to Jesus, they wanted to hear him, they wanted to eat with him, they wanted to be with him. He was a sinner magnet. Not because he was a sinner. But he had what their hearts were longing for. And so Jesus, in fact, one of the criticisms he got from the religious folk was that, well, you're always with them people who are in the spiritual dark. He says, that's kind of like why I'm here. It's kind of like we are here because we are the light of the world. So that's two things not to do with light. Second thought is live as a shaken, uh, live a shaken salt shaker life. Again, not rocket science. Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. So here he references specifically the use of salt for taste, for flavoring. Although there are other uses, salt can preserve, all right? And it was used that way in ancient times. Salt is also a, a good uh, antiseptic. It can clean, clean wounds and whatnot. Uh, if you ever have a cut and you go swim in the ocean, it kind of makes it better just by swimming in the ocean being exposed to salt water. So there's a, if you're looking for a, an excuse to go to the beach, there you go, all right? But see, we are supposed to flavor the world and we're supposed to be that Jesus flavor. And so what I want to do is I'm going to count to three. All right, last night it must have asked too fast or what because they didn't quite catch on, but you've had your coffee. So um, I'm going to count to three and I want you to say like where you live. All right, either your street, your township, your, your suburb, whatever, okay? And then count to three, ready? One, two, three. And you are to be salt there. You're to change the flavor of your neighborhood. You're to, you're to bring a, a, a taste of kindness, patience, compassion, mercy. Let's try it again. Let's, let's on the count of three, either where you work or where you go to school uh, or where you used to work if you're retired. Now let's do something else. Um, where you like to go shop. One of those three. Ready? One, two, three. Your salt. I try not to use too much salt at this stage of life, although one place I cannot win the battle of not using salt, I don't know why, I've said it before, is when I go to Olive Garden, the salad is like five times better with salt on it. And it's the kind you grind, right? So I, I, just, put, oh, I just put a ridiculous amount of salt. I, just, oh, I, just, I don't know why, it just tastes so good. I don't do it at home, just do it at Olive, Olive Garden. But, but here's the problem. Far too many of us as salt, stay in the shaker. We get in our salt shaker vehicles and we come to church and park in a parking lot with a bunch of other salt vehicles. And we come into a building full of salt. We might bump into other salt and say hi to other salts. We get our coffee from somebody that's salt. And we come in here and we sit in the row next to other salt people. Look around. They're all salt. Most of them. 90% of people here are already salt. Okay? 10% of you aren't, and you're wondering, what in the world is going on? I right? just, hang on, hang on. It'll all come together. And, and so we, we don't, if you don't like your neighborhood, if you don't care for the climate at work or school, guess who's able to change the flavor? Say, we are. Yeah. Not them. They're not salt. You are. They don't change the flavor of culture, you do. They don't, they don't preserve, you do, we do. And sadly, again, Christian sociologists would tell us 
we're in trouble. If you go back to 1940, yesterday at the Man in the Mirror conference, they shared some troubling stats. In 1940, 73% of Americans had a church home they attended regularly. And you're talking like probably three or four times a month, every time the doors are open. That's 1940, before almost all of us were born. In 2020, that's less than half. Now 47% of Americans say, I have a church home that I attend. But regular attendance now is not four times a month. It's probably one or, one or two times a month. And the fastest growing religious group in America that went in 2000, just in 2007, from 2007 till now, 15 years, in 2007 it was 16% of Americans, now it's up almost 30%, is people with no religion. That should create a woo in us. The fastest growing religious group in our nation is people who say, no thanks, or got me. No religion. It seems that there's not enough salt. I think there's plenty of salt to go around. There's just not enough salt out of the shaker. There's plenty of light to light things up. There's just too many of us hiding it. And so right now you're like, oh, he's going to ask me to do something with lost people. <laughs> yeah. But relax, because first of all, so let's look at Jesus. What does Jesus tell us to do? And the cool thing is what Jesus tells us to do, it's like baby steps. I can do baby steps, can't you? Just, just like just baby steps, okay? I might not be able to do the long jump, okay? But I can do baby steps. And so final point says, don't underestimate the power of kindness shining through. Shine through the darkness. Jesus said it in Matthew ch chapter 5, verse 16. Let your light, say our light. our light. Let your light shine before men such a way that they may see your fantastic sermons. No, see your good works, good deeds. And glorify your Father who's in heaven. What? I can do good deeds. You can do good deeds. Are we overstating that? Well, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father. Glorify means is that you may esteem, they may esteem your Father. That they may go, whoa, where did that come from? that there would be a spiritual curiosity stirred in them by the way you live. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was a Lutheran pastor in Germany, a uh, great theologian, phenomenal author. If you haven't read The Cost of Discipleship, it is a compelling read uh, by Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He was also uh, involved in an assassination plot against Hitler. S the sad irony of it is that he was hanged for that a month before the Nazis surrendered. But he made this statement. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, your life as a Christian should make non-believers question their disbelief in God. Your life as a Christian should make non-believers say, you know, the way you like care about people and you love them and you forgive and your perseverance and the way you go through the ups and downs of just just the, the person you are makes you think, man, if there was a Jesus, I would figure his followers were like you. If there was a God who was like kind and loving and merciful, I would kind of see people like you being the kind of people that he had. Your life as a Christian should make non-believers question their disbelief in God. And your life as a Christian can draw non-Christians' attention to God simply by the way you live and the kindness and the good deeds that you do. That is the opening the door to the rest of the journey. And so we're going to sort of illustrate that. And, and so the, the, the missing ingredient here is me plus God plus faith plus my Jerusalem. Everybody say my Jerusalem. And if you're new here, you're like, I've never been to Israel. I don't know what that's about. Well, Jesus' last words before he ascended into heaven after he resurrected, he told his disciples to go make disciples. And he told them, I'll be with you always when you do that. And he said, the Holy Spirit's going to come upon you and you'll receive power to be my witnesses. You're going to be my salt and light. You're going to do that in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, in the uttermost parts. 
That means nothing to us if we don't understand New Testament geography. So if we go back to the New Testament, Jerusalem is right where they were. So that is where you live. That's this building. We're our Jerusalem. And that's where you live, where you work, where you go to school, or your kids, where you work out, where you do sports, where you shop. It's where you do life. That's your Jerusalem. Samaria's planting churches, uh, or, or Judea is, Samaria's cross-cultural, and what, I don't know, but, but right now we're focusing on this. You, plus God, who said, I want you to be salt and light, plus faith, the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. I can close my eyes, and with faith, I can picture God using me to impact and be a blessing to my neighbors, my coworkers, my friends. In your Jerusalem makes great possibilities, and we're going to illustrate that. So what I want you to do that we don't normally do in church, I want to encourage you to go ahead and get your cell phone out. All right, so get, don't tell me you don't have one. We've all got one, so get your phone out. And what we're going to do, now it seems like these directions were complicated to second or first service. I'm not sure why. Uh, so I'm going to ask you a series of questions. And you're simply going to, there's, and there's two rounds. The first round, you're just going to say, yes, this has happened to me. And if it did, I want you to turn your light on and just do one of these. Okay, let's do a practice vote. Okay, everybody turn your light on. Give me a little wave. All right, some of you are like, I'm not going to do it. Come on, don't make me come down there and get your phone out. Okay, good. All right, so now, let me also say this. Turn it down. And when you turn it down, you have to turn it off because last night we had it on camera and everybody who thought they'd just point the floor, you still lit up. So, all right. So here's, what, and I, let me explain. I'm going to ask you in different environments, has anyone ever done a kind deed toward you or a spiritual gesture? Here's what we're defining as a spiritual gesture. They, it could be as simple as they said, I'll be praying for you. Or they told you about their church. Maybe they shared their faith. Maybe they invited you to church. But whatever, maybe they had a prayer with you. I don't know. They did some kind of spiritual gesture toward you or they did a kind deed toward you any time in your life. All right? So with that said, I need a little bit of dark to help make the point. So question number one. I see your phone. Okay. <laughs> And yours, and yours, and yours. <laughs> now you're letting much just to get to me. Okay, all right. So, at any time in your life, has a neighbor ever done a kind deed or a spiritual gesture to you? If so, light up and give me a wave. A neighbor. Wow, we live in the right neighborhoods. Woo! Wonderful. Okay, that vote's done. Good. Next one. Has anyone ever done a kind deed or a spiritual gesture at school or on campus at a university toward you? Okay, still pretty good. Not quite as many as the neighborhood, but good. Okay, vote down. Next one. Has a coworker where you've worked ever done a kind deed or spiritual gesture? Now think about it. Don't just automatic. Okay, still pretty good. All right, good. Hand out, vote down. When you've been shopping or eating out, has anyone ever done a kind gesture a kind deed or a spiritual gesture. Give it a give it a vote. Got to think particularly. Okay. Good. Somebody paid it forward and bought your coffee at McDonald's at the drive-through. All right. Good. All right. And then finally, at a sports event that you were in or your kids were in, has anyone ever done a kind deed or or a spiritual gesture? That's always the least. We're kind of competitive on the sports field, but there's still a pretty good crowd. All right. All right. Um, Actually, I got one more. Did anyone ever tell you about CLC or did you ever come to Christ because of what someone else said or did toward you? Give it a vote. Wow. All right. Now, I don't know what was going through your mind, but I can think of lots of memories of someone doing a kind deed. I remember when I was a kid, man, this was probably almost 60 years ago, walking home from kindergarten or first grade in Cleveland, and it's icy out, and I fell down on the sidewalk, and I don't know who the guy was. There was a guy walking behind us, and he just stopped, picked me up, went, you okay, little man? And then off he went. <laughs> 60 years ago, a faceless, nameless man. I just remember his kind deed. Boom, how that made me feel. 
And so here's the last question. There's two parts to this response. I'm going to ask this question, and if it fits you, then I'm going to ask you to light up and stand up. Okay? So we're adding a little physical exercise to it. Okay. So hear the whole question out. Get mine ready. So, if you ever did a kind deed or had a spiritual gesture that you expressed to someone in your neighborhood, at school, on campus, a coworker, shopping, eating out, or at sports, if you've ever done those to anyone in those environments, would you light up and stand up? Let's see. Hopefully, it's unanimous. All right? Give it a wave and look around. Just look around. Look around the room. Look at all these people saying, yep, been there, done that. So would you say out loud, we can do this. Okay, let's get the lights up in the auditorium. And I'm glad you said that because, wow, when do you see what we're going to do? You can take a seat. <laughs> you just said it. We can do this. And this is where I have to tell all our online folks, I'm sorry, but we have to, we have to exit now. Um, you can now post about this after service is over so the surprise isn't ruined. So please do post and watch your, your, face, your uh, social media and you can see what we did. Thanks for being with us. Hopefully you'll be this Wednesday, next weekend, whatever. We're glad to have you online. Have a wonderful day. God bless.